Several, several weeks ago, maybe even two or three months ago, I made an observation uh, as the pastor. And I said, the church is broken. And you know, you get a lot of nods, acknowledgement, after making a statement like that. But then I also said, but God is healing the church. And for weeks and, and even a few months now, God has been working wonderfully well in our church, in our worship services. And we have worked to cultivate an atmosphere of freedom. And if you come in to worship on Sunday morning here at Gunnersville First, and you're struggling with something, your heart is hurting, your heart is broken uh, over your own life, over something going on in the life of a loved one, uh, you, you do not need to have to wait until the end of the service to be welcomed to the altar to find God's presence, God's healing, God's deliverance, wh whatever God is doing in the moment. You don't have to wait. We are cultivating and encouraging an atmosphere of freedom so that God can do what God is doing without our hindrance. Now, God is a God of order. He's not the author of confusion. But everything I've seen this morning has been done wonderfully well and in Holy Spirit order. And God is touching and God is blessing and God is healing. So, you know, if, if you're a little newer to uh, life here at Gunnersville First, I just want you to know God's healing broken hearts. And if you see somebody come down to this altar during a song and you wonder, what that's, what's that about? I'm, I'm not used to that. Uh, get used to it. And let that be okay with you, because if you haven't made your trip down to the altar, yours may be coming soon. And you know what? I want you to feel the freedom that everyone else has felt to find strength and healing, deliverance, whatever. Even, even for you to come and just surrender yourselves afresh and anew to God. We want God to be God in this place, and we want church to be what God desires it to be. And my goodness, Jesus went in the temple and he said, My house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. And you've made it a den of thieves. God's house shall be called a house of prayer first and foremost. And we want to make sure we don't forget what Jesus' heart, mind, and will is for his church and for his house. I want to share some thoughts with you this morning. We've entitled Tough Love. And it's from Matthew chapter 18. And Ma Jesus is really addressing uh, several difficult issues in Matthew chapter 18. Some of them are relationship oriented. You know, the disciples before this uh, 15th verse are, are debating yet again who's going to be greatest among them. Uh, you ever have any sib sibling rivalry in your house? You know, who's going to be the, the king of the mountain? Or maybe among your friends, who's going to be the leader of the pack? Or, or things like that. And we know sometimes along the way as we're living life in relationship with other people that we get offended. Somebody offends us either knowingly or unknowingly. And Jesus knew that was a part of daily life because we're in relationships and because we are fallen human beings, because we have a sin nature, we, we have the tendency sometimes to maybe uh, snap back at somebody and hurt their feelings. Uh, you know, sometimes I am reminded by my wife that I can be short, not in stature. I am 5'10 and a quarter. I'm hanging on to that quarter. You know, you get older and you kind of do like this. But, you, you know, sometimes I'm on the phone and, and my wife loves me and, and she loves me enough to correct me. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a little bit. Guys, fathers, even children, my wife loves me enough to help me be a better person. And I want to tell you, I, I, I believe the, this morning that the church is at its best when the church is helping other people be their best. And what Jesus is talking about here in correction and, and how to deal with 
offense. He is helping us to be our best. And we help others be their best. And we're our best at the same time. So we're going to read this. We've given it the title, Tough Love, because sometimes confronting somebody about the sin they have committed against me or you is hard to do. It's tough, but it's love and it's tough love. If your brother sins against you, go and tell all your friends, the people in the workplace, even maybe people you don't know. No, that's not what Jesus said. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's some pretty clear guidance, isn't it, church? If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I among them. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. Two or three are gathered here, and God is in our midst. My wife and I have been happily married for 36 years now. She is my best friend. She is my partner in ministry. And I love that lady like you can never imagine. A lot of why I am the person that I am today, the father I am, the pastor that I am, God has worked through her. And you're saying, Pastor Ricky, it's Father's Day, not Mother's Day. <laughs> well, I like to give credit where credit is due. Part of what has made our relationship as as fun and, and wonderful and fruitful is that early on we had some conversations and we kind of set precedence and, and I think precedence is, is vitally, vitally important because whatever you do the first time it sets the precedent of how you're going to handle things further down the road in life and in relationship. And, and I've told you this story before. It's no secret. You may have heard it if you were here last time I told it. But Nona and I had been married probably four or five or six months, not that very long. And we had an opportunity to go over to one of her friend's house, her and her husband, and just spend some time with them. Nona was good friends with her and another lady in the church she attended. Matter of fact, she was with those two ladies when Nona and I met in Panama City Beach, Florida, while we were both on vacation. And uh, obviously that relationship continued, and 36 years later, four kids later, seven grandkids later, here we are. But we was at that friend's house one evening, and we were just kind of talking, and they're, you know, how's married life, how's married life, and things like that. And, and we're talking, and we're just kind of celebrating our marriage. And, and, and then Nona said something that, wow, really got my attention. She said to the couple there. Well, there's one thing about him I don't understand. And you know, my antennas and ears went up really quick when she said that because she was fixing to say something to them about me that she didn't understand. And when she said she didn't understand it, I could tell it was not a positive that she didn't understand. It was a negative. And she said, you know, at night, gets ready for bed, instead of putting his clothes in the dirty clothes basket, which is down at the end of the bed in the corner of the room, he lays his pants and his shirt down beside the bed. She said, I just don't understand that. And I'm thinking to myself, you'll understand when we get home. <laughs> now, Nona was not trying to be offensive. We were just having conversation among friends. 
And there was really, in her heart and mind, no reason why I should have been offended by that statement. And, and I, hey, you can, she can say anything she wants to about me now, and we just laugh it off and go on because we have found that as we share stories about ourselves and our relationship, we help other people by doing that. And, and I mean, things happen now, and we laugh it off and go on, but I wasn't laughing that night because I was embarrassed because she was talking about my personal habits in front of a couple of people that I barely even knew. And I thought, now wait a minute, this, this, this feels awkward, 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 awkward. So we got home and, and, and I told her, I said, look, what you said, man, that, that embarrassed me. That, I, man, I, I felt very, very awkward, and, and I, don't, I don't even think she knew what I was talking about. And I said, hey, you know about me putting my clothes down by the bed, this, that, and everything else? And I said, have you ever thought about why I may put my clothes by the bed at night? Well, I didn't understand why you did that. And I said, well, who's going to answer the door when somebody knocks on the door at 2 o'clock in the morning? She said, you are. <laughs> She knew the answer to that one really quick. And I said, yes. And I want to be properly dressed for anyone that's on the other side of the door. So if I have my shirt and pants here, buddy, I can change. I can put them on real quick and go right to the door to see what's going on. That's why I do that. And thankfully, I think there's only been one time that I had to do that. But it was an occasion of a tragedy in the church. But there was a purpose and a reason for that. So I went to Nona and I said, Nona, that, you know, that, that kind of offended me that you would be that public with our private life. Now we just tell everybody everything. But we set a precedent early on that if I hurt her feelings, she hurt my feelings, or made us feel awkward or anything like that, we set the precedent... As illustrated in God's Word, if somebody offends you, go and tell them, hey, you may know this, you may not know this, but what you said, what you did really offended me. Now, nine times out of ten, I just about guarantee you that person will say, I am so sorry, I did not know that what I said or what I did was offensive to you. Please forgive me. But guess what, church? If you don't follow through with Jesus' instruction to go and do that, you will not give them the opportunity to say, I am so sorry, I did not know I offended you. If we choose to go tell everybody else or a few people are our best friend, we have chosen to not follow the direction of God's Word. And God's Word is there for a purpose and a reason. To give us guidance in life. That we might handle the situations in life in a godly and holy and Christ-like fashion. And can I tell you this morning what you already know. God and Jesus and Holy Spirit are all about relationship. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, the creation story, God created Adam and was there in relationship with him. The creator, the created. And when God saw Adam was alone and it wasn't good, from Adam God brought Eve so that what? They could be in relationship. And it didn't take too far down the road in the history of humankind to see that humankind would need guidance in both their relationship with God and their relationships with each other. When we received the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, the first four were about relationship with God. The following six of the ten were about how we conduct ourselves with people around us. How we have relationship with those people around us. So Jesus said, if your brother, your sister sins against you, go and tell them or tell him or her their fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. I, you know... Over the years as a pastor, I've been a pastor 31 years, I've had people to come up to me and say, Pastor Ricky, so-and-so said this and that was offensive to me. So-and-so did this and that offended me. You want to know what my first question is? I will ask them, have you gone and told that person you were offended? 
I, 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 I don't like conflict. I don't like confrontation. Do you like Jesus? Do you want to get rid of conflict? Do you want to resolve and get rid of confrontation? Then go be reconciled to your brother and your sister. Because God is a God of reconciliation. God told us that through Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. God not counting our sins against us but placing our sins upon Him that we might be reconciled to God. And and now God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. I want to tell you what, as they say, we ought to be like a chicken on a June bug. When something pops up, we need to be quick to go and address it. I really, 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 can you say really? You can. You're paying attention today. Thank you so much for paying attention to my sermon. I've prepared. I've prayed. I've hoped somebody would show up to hear it. And here you are, and lo and behold, you're paying attention. Isn't that wonderful? Absolutely. Now then, if you know or are fans of the Andy Griffith Show, I I love the Andy Griffith Show. If you are familiar with that, I'll tell you some of the younger generations, they don't even know what that is. Well, if you know what that is, you will know Barney Fife. You're giggling already because you remember something stupid he did on the show, and it made you laugh. But Barney Fife had a phrase that we ought to bring into the context of our sermon today that is so applicable, and I think you can remember the phrase if I share it with you one time. Barney Fife said, nip it in the bud. Now, what does that mean? That means go ahead and deal with it before it has a chance to grow into something greater and more harmful. We have the opportunity to nip it in the bud when we are offended if we will just do what the Word of God has instructed us to do and go to that person and say, Hey, you have offended me. I want you to know that for one reason. Not so I can rub your sin in your face, but so that we can be reconciled and that there will not be anything between me and you. See, that, that's the tough part for me in my relationship with Nona. If I have offended her, whether she said anything about it or not, I can sense there's something between us that needs to be removed. So I'll ask her, are you okay? Are we okay? Is there everything good? Did, did I say something? Did I do something unknowingly? And we will get that out there and discuss those things. And we will go ahead and nip it in the bud and deal with it in its infancy so that it doesn't have a chance to grow into something bigger and greater. There's probably things around your house that today you wished you had dealt with a year, two years, ten years down the road. You, you saw a little crack in the, in the foundation from the outside and thought, hmm, that's interesting. And ten years later, your house is sloping ten inches downhill, and you're going, oh my goodness, why didn't I deal with that when I first saw the crack instead of waiting for my house to be in such terrible shape? It's going to cost me so much money now to have this fixed if I would had only addressed it in its infancy. Kudzu. Have, do do y'all have any kudzu seed? Y'all have any kudzu seed? Nobody? Nobody wants kudzu seed because when it begins to grow, it takes over, it kills trees, it chokes things out. But if I saw the first little sprout of a kudzu vine on my property, let me tell you, I would probably get a shovel and dig it up by the roots so it never had an opportunity to grow and take over and bring death and destruction. I I liken sin to kudzu. It's small and it's innocent when it starts, but my goodness, it causes great damage before it's done. So Jesus has given us some great 
guidance here. To go to that brother, to go to that sister and say, look, I've been offended by something you said, something you did. I want us to clear the air and go forward together united in heart, mind, and will because we are the church, we are the body of Christ. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the reason for the beginning of division in the church. Because guess what? If you don't address it early on, it's going to cause some sense of division in the church. So if you want to think about two reasons why Jesus gave us this teaching, number one is so that we could go and nip it in the bud. We could go and destroy it and deal with it in its infancy before it ever had an opportunity to become something greater, which leads us to the second reason why Jesus would give us this teaching. Jesus doesn't want the devil to have the opportunity to bring division to the church. How many times, think about it over the years, how many times has something happened between two people? And it was not properly dealt with to begin with. And people begin to take sides. Do y'all know that people are good at taking sides? Yes, we are good at taking sides. And then you have two sides, not two individuals, but you have two sides. And I want you to know this morning that the devil will pour the fuel on the fire of your hurt feelings. And especially he'll pour fuel on the fire of division in the church. Because he knows exactly what Jesus said. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And if he can bring division to the church and fan the flames of division in the church, he knows he has an opportunity to hinder, to harm, to bring down the life and the ministry of a church. We are aware of his tactics. We are aware of his motivations. And we should not fall prey to them. I don't want to be the devil's prey. The Bible says that the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking and looking for those whom he may devour. When he comes to Guntersville first, when he comes to my heart, when he comes to my family, I don't want him to find something that he can devour. I don't want him to see a church that he can devour. I don't want him to see a home or a family that he can divide and conquer and devour. I want him to see a family. I want him to see a church that is spiritually prepared for what he brings our way. And as a matter of fact, if we would keep that in the forefront of our heart and mind and know that when somebody offends me, I just need to let it wash off my back like water off a duck's back, or... If I need to go address that person, go address the person. And my motivation is, number one, that's what Jesus said to do. And number two, I will not be the responsible party for the devil bringing division in the church that I love and appreciate. If the devil's going to bring division, he's going to have to look for somebody else, not me. Because if I get offended, I'm going to go talk to that person. Because I'm not going to give an opportunity to the devil to bring division to my family, division to my church. I'm going to do what Jesus said to do in this circumstance, in this situation. He said, well, what if they don't listen? Well, Jesus has already answered the question. If you go one-on-one -on -one and they don't listen, go get a couple of more elders of the church. Go get somebody with spiritual maturity who is spiritually prepared for the moment and take them as witnesses, not as cheerleaders, not as somebody to condemn them, but take them as witnesses that you are trying to reconcile this relationship, this situation, and if they won't hear two or three, take it before the church, and if that person still refuses to repent and apologize and work toward reconciliation, then that person, Jesus said, should be considered not as a member of the body of Christ, but as an outsider to the church who needs repentance, 
Reconciliation with God and reconciliation with the church. Jesus takes this very, very seriously, church, to the point that if the person will not heed the teaching and the warning of Scripture and the actions of brothers and sisters in Christ, if that person won't heed, then that person needs to be removed. Because Jesus knows what we know. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And we don't want something small to be allowed to grow and destroy and hinder and harm the life of the church. Let me share this statement with you. Open your heart. Open your mind. If you remember anything this morning, remember what I'm fixing to tell you. A church that stands together against sin will not soon be divided by sin. A church that stands together against sin, especially within the church family, will not soon be divided by sin. Jesus gives us this teaching for a purpose and a reason, and we need to hear this teaching this morning. So church... May we work together to build the unity and the harmony of the church as we heed the words of Jesus. Sometimes it takes tough love. We invite our praise team to come back to the uh, stage and lead us in a final uh, song of worship. Now let me tell you, what if you don't? Do what the Bible says you're supposed to do. If you don't go to that person, now you are in sin as much as that person is in sin. Because if Jesus has told us what to do and we don't do it, it is sin. And God takes it very, very seriously when we don't heed the teaching He's given us. A teaching that is for the betterment, the benefit, the health, the future of the life of the church. You may need to come to the altar this morning and say, Father, I'm sorry. I didn't go to that person. I didn't tell them. I told two or three other people, but I didn't tell them. And you know what? I violated the teaching of your word. I need to repent. I need to get my heart right. And Father, as soon as everything's good between me and you, I promise you, Father, I'm going to go talk to that person. And we're going to clear the air and we're going to set the record straight and we're going to unite our hearts and minds back again together with your heart and mind to your glory and to our blessing. Church, I pray, hear the word of the Lord this morning. And if you have any need or reason to respond or you have any other need to come to this altar and pray, this altar is open for the prayers of God's church. Let us stand and worship.